Um, Panaun da Paub, Aileen Dwi, Akadirid, Kaviandra Masnak Kumri, Kroiso E, Katin Debai, Masnak Bidiang, Erhan Vodion. Good afternoon. I'm Aileen, the Chair of Trade Justice Wales. Welcome to Global Trade Deals The Basics. Um, trade Justice Wales is a network of organisations and academics with an interest in different trade justice areas. It is a small project that has been funded from Cardiff University's Innovation for All Fund and is uh, partnered with the Wales Governance Centre. Um, and we have a rep from there today, Charles, um, and also us at Fair Trade Wales. Um, the project of Trade Justice Wales aims to address the knowledge and skills gap around trade by providing networking, knowledge sharing and training opportunities. Um, and today we have our first training session on the basics of global trade deals, which is being run by Ruth Bergen, the director of the Trade Justice Movement. Um, so if anyone has any questions throughout, then please use the chat box. And then when you're given the opportunity, just turn your mic on and you're very welcome to ask questions because we're a small group here today. Um, and thank you for introducing yourselves in the chat. And I think I will hand over to Ruth to start our session. Thanks, Aileen, and um, thanks everybody for coming today. Um, I'm just going to try and share my screen, which hopefully will work seamlessly. Uh, and then, so I think it's telling me you can all see my screen. Is that, yeah, Aileen, that looks looks like it's all working great so um, I'm going to cover three different sections and what I'm going to do is talk for a bit on each of the sections and then leave a bit of time for questions at the end of those sections just so that you don't have to listen to me um, talking for too long at a time um, so what we're going to cover today is uh, broadly what a trade policy is and what a trade deal is and kind of what's different um, about those two things the process of making a trade deal in the UK so po obviously post Brexit we now have our uh, competence for trade and investment back from the EU. Um, and then I'm going to give an example of how trade interacts with climate change and with climate policy. So hopefully by the end of it, you'll, you'll have a kind of overview of all of those things. Now, Amy was very clear that I wasn't allowed to use acronyms, but if you're a trade expert, that, that's sort of why you get paid is to know your way around all the acronyms. So I thought we could start with a bit of a, a kind of icebreaker involving all the acronyms I could think of. Um, or at least some of them. Um, so what I want you to do is in the chat, I'm gonna put some acronyms up on the screen and I want you to write in as many of them as you know. So if you see an acronym that you know, just write in the chat. Okay, I can't see all of you nodding, but I'm, I'm assuming you're all kind of fired up with enthusiasm for this trade-based acronym game. And I'm gonna go ahead. So <laughs> no acronyms. Um, <laughs> so here we go, WTO. Um, Put your answers in the in the chat. WTO, what's the WTO? World Trade Organization, good. FTA. Free Trade Agreement, got it. DIT. Charles is, Charles is kind of leading here. DIT, anyone? Department for International Trade, DCMS. Uh, in fact, we're gonna, we're gonna, yes. Well, Department of Culture, Department of uh, Digital Culture, Media and Sport, importantly, DEFRA. Yes, environment and food and rural affairs. Bays. Bays, anyone? Business, yes, business energy and industrial strategy. FCDO, important today because we've got the release of the international development strategy. That's a clue. FCDO, anyone? Ooh, foreign, yes, foreign commonwealth and development office. OK, moving on to the trade stuff more kind of specifically, I'm going to explain why I went through all those departments in a minute. There is a reason. GATT. Yep. General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, GATT. What's that? <laughs> You've got GATT and then GATT, so kind of sister agreement, trade and services. That's right. BIT, B-I-T, what's a BIT? It's another try kind of agreement. I think Alien probably knows this one. Mm. Bit bilateral investment treaty. Didn't see anyone get that one before I before I. But that, very important, and we're going to talk a bit more about those. ISDS. It's a part of a bit. Investor to state dispute settlement. Yeah, some of you might have heard about that. Uh, SDGs. 
out today, important today, sustainable development goals, good. Uh, the TAC, who's heard of the TAC? It's a thing, it's a body. Trade and Agriculture Commission, very new on the back of quite a lot of campaigning, including by farmers. Uh, ITC, also important, this time for scrutiny. In fact, also for scrutiny, the TAC has a scrutiny role. What's the ITC? International Trade Committee. This is the committee uh, in the UK Parliament that scrutinizes trade agreements. And then last but not least, the STAG. What's the STAG? Strategic Trade Advisory Group, that's it. So I'm gonna quickly go through some of these. Oh, sorry, I think the chat is stopping me from... Yeah, there we go. So the World Trade Organization, very briefly, just to explain how these things all interact. It sets the baseline for trade rules. So the UK is part of the WTO now as an independent country, um, as are most of the countries in the world. I think it's 164 countries are, are members of the WTO. And the rules that are set at the WTO set the baseline for what you're allowed to do in your own independent trade deal. So you can you have to start with the baseline of the WTO and you have to go beyond it in your free trade agreements, which is next. Free trade agreements can either be between two parties, so bilateral, or you can join plurilateral. So bilateral ones include, so the UK, Australia deal that's just been signed. Plurilateral, we've got the comprehensive and progressive um, Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, CPTPP, um, which the UK rather unusually wants to join, unusual because we're not a Pacific country, um, but it's a plurilateral. So there are 11 member countries at the moment. Um, DIT, the Department for International Trade is the UK, um, department that deals with trade, um, but the other departments are also important. So DCMS, DEFRA, BASE and FCDO all have um, trade departments within, within them. Um, last time I looked, although this is old information, health didn't, which is curious. They may have one by now, um, but it was odd because health is dealt with under trade agreements, as we will see. So all of those um, departments have an interest in what goes into trade agreements, and we'll see a bit more about why that is later. So uh, GATT and GATS are some of the foundational agreements of the WTO. So GATT actually predates the WTO. It's the, the international agreement that's covered trade right back to 1948, but it um, only really dealt with trading goods. And what's different and important about the WTO is that it goes way beyond goods. So you, you see services, which is GATS, but you also get into things like intellectual property, you eventually get into government procurement, you get into um, certain aspects of investment. So the trade agenda expands quite significantly in 1995 when you get the foundation of the WTO. Bilateral investment treaties, as the name suggests, are between two countries and they cover investment protection. Um, they cover investment and offer quite a lot of protections to investments, to investors. One of those is in the form of something called Investor to State Dispute Settlement, ISDS, which is where an investor has the ability to sue a government if a policy or its implementation um, impact uh, on, on, their, on the profitability of their investment. I'll come back to some examples of how that gets used. Um, SDG is the Sustainable Development Goals. Hopefully you're fairly familiar with those. Um, the International Trade Committee, um, the committee of the UK Parliament that scrutinises trade agreements um, made up of um, representatives from most of the major, at least the major parties. Oh, sorry, didn't mean to do that. And finally, the Trade and Agriculture Commission came out of, to some extent, campaigning by the NFU, WWF and other organisations calling for better scrutiny, particularly coming from a point of view of concern about the impact on farming standards uh, and food standards. Um, so we, I'll talk a little bit more about what they do later on. Okay, so that was a, a quick kind of overview of some of the bits and pieces within the, the trade uh, architecture. Um, so in the UK, you, you sort of have two, two different things. You have trade policy, which is the kind of overarching approach so what the government is aiming to do with its newly regained um, competence for trade and investments and and there you have that covers deals but it also covers things like export promotion so supporting businesses who want to trade internationally 
um, financing some, some kind of business through UK export finance, and also things like trade defense. So if you think a country is dumping goods at below cost, um, you have a mechanism at the moment, it's called the Trade Remedies Authority that allows you to take action um, in that respect. Um, so those are some of the things that your trade policy covers. Trade deals are one part of that, although quite a big part of that. Um, and as I've said, they're between partners, so they're, they're negotiated. Um, something that I think is very much worth uh, bearing in mind is that they are both binding and enforceable. There's not much else in the international landscape that is both binding and enforceable. I think there's one, uh, one environmental agreement, the Montreal Agreement, uh, which was on um, CFCs. That's binding and enforceable, interestingly, through a trade mechanism, actually. Um, and then some human rights law through the different international courts of human rights also have a degree of enforceability. But, but for example, the Paris Climate Agreement is not binding, um, nor is it, strictly speaking, enforceable at an international level, although sometimes countries can put sort of binding mechanisms in their national um, implementation. Um, trade deals also have quite broad coverage. So obviously a policy goes beyond a deal, but as we'll see, they still cover, and as you have heard when I was talking about what the WTO addresses, um, they still cover some really broad areas of, of policy and, and really of everyday life. So that includes sort of the food on your table, your access to healthcare, um, you know, environmental rules um, are all impacted by what goes into trade agreements. Um, I have a blank page for UK government trade policy because there isn't one. There is not a published UK government trade strategy at the moment. Um, we think this is a huge gap. We think it's a bit strange. In 2011, when we didn't have competence for our uh, trade and investment, we had a hundred page document setting out what we thought the priorities should be. So it's a bit strange. And it's one of our main asks is that they provide uh, a strategy of some description. And specifically what we want to know is how uh, this aspect of, of policy that can be so wide ranging impacts on things like how, how, it, how they are going to align it with their international commitments on things like climate change, the sustainable development goals, and, and also with their national commitments in various areas. What we do know is that um, they are committed to signing as many deals as possible. People from within the civil service, most of whom have left by now, um, confirm that actually the impetus in DIT is just to get as many deals over the line as possible, which is, as you will have noticed, is what Johnson and others were promising um, as the main prize of Brexit was this ability to um, deliver independent trade deals. Within trade deals, we know that um, trade in services, so that includes things like accountancy and financial services, but also education and health. Um, and also digital trade um, are a priority. So digital trade can be everything from how you govern data. So what you're allowed to do with data generated in your country or that you want to export out of a, a different country back into your country. It can be the rules around who gets to see what's gone into the source code. So the things that are driving um, your digital products. And some of you might remember that VW got uh, caught out cheating because they had a bit of equipment in their cars that allowed the car to detect when it was being tested. And so in a test, it would generate a certain level of emissions that it didn't in ordinary usage. Um, and because no one was allowed to read the source code, they didn't work that out, that they didn't figure out that that was what was happening for a really long time. So which is just sort of an example of how digital trade rules can be quite important. Um, we have manifesto commitments from the Conservatives not to put the NHS on the table in trade agreements. We have doubts about what that means exactly and the extent to which it is actually off the table. And we also have a commitment not to undermine environmental standards. But again, we, we have some caveats about that. So then just to move on quickly to what's in a trade deal to just go into a little bit more detail. So. I've set out here um, a fairly comprehensive list of the kinds of chapters you might expect to see in a trade agreement. So a trade agreement will look at uh, trading goods, which I think is what most people think of when they think of trade agreements. So that covers the taxes you pay at the border. It covers the rules that, that kind of dictate what you can class as, as a good from your country. So you know, if you're making a car, 
it will say, okay, this proportion of the car has to be made in your country in order for it to qualify as um, a British uh, a British car. So that so that the rules in your trade agreement with let's say um, Australia apply to that car. Um, and, and that's not the case if too much of what's happened um, has happened in a different country. You have uh, sanitary and phytosanitary standards. So things like what level of toxins are allowed on nuts, uh, what level of pesticides, and then uh, technical barriers to trade. So how your regulations are impacting on your ability to trade. Um, services, as I've mentioned, intellectual property. So that's all of your patent rules and so on. Government procurement, investment, digital trade, competition, state owned enterprises, SMEs, innovation. And then we also have uh, four chapters that are often of kind of relatively more interest to civil society, which are on labor, environment, development, and gender. Uh, not all of them appear in all deals, and sometimes they're called slightly different things. They're in blue because, in contrast to the rest of the deal, they're not enforceable. So most, for most of the time, they don't come under the same enforceability mechanisms as rules on things like goods. So you can see that this is this is how they end up being very comprehensive um, agreements. Um, I am not an expert on devolution or the impacts on for the kind of devolved context, but I've tried to summarize some of the things that I know and, and George, uh, Charles can probably supplement um, more information if, if that's of interest. Um, so trade is a reserved uh, competence, so it's reserved to Westminster, um, but trade deals do cover regulation, procurement and other policies that are devolved, things like um, health and social care, education, transport, environmental regulation. Um, investor to say dispute settlement can be used to challenge devolved level uh, decision making. So, for example, in Canada, um, Quebec had a feed in tariff regime that required a certain amount of what's called local content. So it wanted to demonstrate that investment in its renewable sector was going to bring local jobs. Uh, that was challenged at the WTO successfully. Quebec ended up rolling back its feed in tariff uh, program quite significantly. Um, there are some arrangements for de devolved scrutiny, um, including a joint ministerial committee. I don't have lots of detail about what that committee does or what access it has to, for example, negotiating texts, others might know better, um, through the same parliamentary procedures as others, which I will go on to describe. Um, and also the potentially Welsh business rep representation on some of the stakeholder groups. I had a quick look through the businesses that are on some of the stakeholder groups. I could only spot um, the Farmers Union as, of Wales as one that I could sort of clearly identify as being from Wales. There may be others, but it wasn't particularly obvious. Um, so that, that's a, a sort of quick overview. Um, I'm going to pause there and just ask if there are any questions on what I've just covered. Um, I'm going to just give sort of five, five minutes at this point. Um, no. <laughs> Aileen, can you tell me if there are questions? Because I have I'm struggling a bit to see. Yes, certainly. If anyone has a question, please feel free to unmute or to put it in the chat. I'm interested in the, the Quebec example. So essentially what you're saying is that Quebec said we want investment in local jobs when we procure and they were basically told they couldn't do that because of a Canada trade agreement so that yeah, could easily no, happen in Wales as well that Wales could make mm. a policy decision and because of a, a UK trade agreement we could be told that that's not allowed here yeah and actually um, that was under the WTO so we wouldn't even need to make a new trade agreement uh, but trade agreements really don't like a thing called local content requirements, which is where you say we'd like international investment into a particular sector, but we want to direct that sector to local benefits. So in the case of the Quebec uh, feed and tariff programme, they wanted 50 or 60 percent of local content and local content could be anything. It could be where you source your cleaning services, your your office paper. Um, it, you know, it, it could also include some of the components for some of your renewable technology, but I don't, I don't think they were requiring that in particular. Um, it could include a requirement to have a certain amount of research and development um, 
delivered in a particular area. Um, so trade agreements are very, very averse to that. Um, and interestingly, lots and lots of countries have been tripped up by it. Um, it does feel like there needs to be more of a conversation about when those things are appropriate. I mean, if you if you're committed to um, a just transition under under kind of climate policies, then it seems to me that's that's probably an essential part of that. Fab, thank you. I don't think anyone else has got a question. Okay, I will I will crack on. <laughs> so uh, this is section two. So process of making a deal in the UK. The first thing to say about that is that there is no legally enshrined process. We have a command paper, various commitments from different uh, secretaries of state. So Liz Truss and now Anne-Marie Trevelyan um, and letters between the Secretary of State and the International Trade Committee, but very little that's actually set out in law. So what I'm describing is sort of current practice from DIT. Um, and how they've been doing it, so how it's how it's run for Australia and New Zealand effectively, um, and then part of the, the process for the next tranche of trade agreements is they, they run a consultation before the start of formal negotiations that's open to everyone in theory. It's an online uh, consultation. Um, so why I say in theory is that don't necessarily publicize it very widely. I don't think it's very accessible if you're not fairly expert on trade um, or a business actually engaged in trade and lots of the questions um, in fact the questions are really all focused on what are the business opportunities in this country what are the challenges you face do you have particular concerns about specific product lines and that they give the kind of codifications from the WTO um, there's very little room and we've had to sort of shoehorn in any comment about impact on you know, environment, climate change, um, you know, any other kind of justice issues, um, it's quite difficult to find a space for them. So um, it's, it then seems to take them sort of six months or so to look at those consultations, at which point they launch the formal negotiations and at the same time uh, publicise some what they call the public bundle. And that includes a summary of all the consultation responses they've had, uh, a scoping study and also the mandate for negotiation. So that all comes out at once and, they, and then they, they kind of go ahead with the, nego with the negotiations. Um, they have been, so there is a commitment, again, kind of informal commitment to regular, regular updates during the negotiations. Um, our assessment of those is that they are fairly inadequate. Um, you don't really see what's actually being negotiated um, you don't see what text is being developed and, and they're, they're very top line in summary. So they're not much uh, help, really, if you're trying to understand what, what's at stake. They have set up um, quite a large number of stakeholder groups. So there are 11 trade advisory groups which are exclusively made up of business groups. There's the Strategic Trade Advisory Group, which is a ministeri um, ministerial level. Um, the trade advisory groups kind of deal with civil servants and, and um, lead negotiators. We sit on something called the um, thematic working group. There are two of those. Um, and interestingly, the, the business groups, the um, trade advisory groups get to see the negotiating texts before the deal is signed. Um, we do not, um, uh, which has always been a, a kind of interesting approach. Uh, we, we were required to sign a non-disclosure agreement in order to join, but it's not obvious why, because we don't get to see anything confidential as far as we can see. Um, so negotiations proceed. In the case of Australia and New Zealand, they were pretty quick. They were done within the space of about a year, depending on how much you take into account um, talks that might have been informal talks that might have been happening um, before Brexit was agreed. Um, and, and the deal is signed. Um, at which point they publish the text um, alongside a, a full impact assessment. And then you go into ratification under the Agriculture Act. Interestingly, not under the Trade Act, um, the, uh, the Trade and Agriculture Commission has to issue a report. Um, it's only an advisory report. So there's no requirement for the government to act on it. But it, and it looks very narrowly at the impact on the deal for um, UK statutory 
instruments related to, to agriculture. At that point, then the Trade Committee also has that opportunity to scrutinise. The Trade Committee have been sending a number of um, strongly worded letters to Anne-Marie Trevelyan asking for clarity about the amount of time they're going to have to look at, um, at the to have to look at the deal and, and sort of what their role is, because I think they still feel that there's a lot, lot a lack of clarity around that. Um, so then at some point, um, we're not quite sure what the timing is going to be, you enter it, you, you hit something called CRAG, the Constitutional Reform and Governance Act, which gives Parliament 21 sitting days to scrutinise the deal. At the end of that time, it's possible that a debate happens on the floor of the House. However, there's no guarantee of that. So Either the government has to allocate time to that, and it may not want to for a, a variety of reasons, if it thinks the deal is going to be um, controversial in some way, or the opposition has to allocate time. And the, the, the thing to know about that is there are only 22 opposition days um, in a year. And, and so actually, it's quite a challenge to get that, that time for a debate. Um, they would need to give it priority over all of the other issues that they, they might want to allocate a, an opposition day to. Um, even if they get a debate, um, there's no binding vote. So let's say um, the House of Commons decides to vote down a deal. The government can keep bringing the, the trade deal back um, almost without limit <laughs> um, for an unlimited number of times if it wants. Um, uh, you know, and, and kind of the whole process of trying to find time to discuss it then kicks in again. Um, OK. Just by contrast, this is what would used to happen when we were members of the EU. So there is a published trade strategy. The latest one is from 2021. The Council sets and publishes a mandate. Um, the Commission undertakes the negotiations and, um, again, keeps the European Parliament fully informed, um, which I've, I've put in kind of inverted commas, because, again, there's quite a lot of critiques ar around about, about the meaningful whether or not the level of access is meaningful or, or kind of useful um, it reports after every negotiating round to the parliament um, MEPs also have access um, in a very confidential and limited way to negotiating texts the um, the EC publishes position papers negotiating texts reports of negotiations impact assessments and background papers as it's going through the negotiations and once a deal is finalised, it has to be approved by both the Council and the European Parliament. The Parliament is guaranteed a three month window to consider the text. Its trade committee called Inter uh, produces a detailed analysis uh, and opinion, which which sort of drives what's likely to happen in, in the kind of Parliament um, overall vote. Any questions on the scrutiny processes in in the UK? Yeah, I, I have one, Ruth, and it's OK. Um, I'm curious about, you, you've mentioned impact assessments a couple of times. So there, there's some limited impact assessment by the UK government and also for the EU. I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about what a good impact assessment looks like and whether we're there, and if not, what, what we need to see improve. Um, so I, I think to, to give a kind of fully rounded sense of a, an impact assessment might take a little while. Um, the, the EU's impact assessments are certainly more comprehensive than the UK's have been to date. Um, however, some of the main critiques of impact assessments have been, for example, they rest, so they use a thing called community co computer generated equilibrium modeling. And some of the assumptions that are fed in at the early stages of those are quite surprising. So I remember when we were working on the EU-US trade agreement, TTIP, um, it was based on an assumption of full employment across the EU. And, and therefore, it was quite easy for them to suggest that where jobs were lost in certain sectors, there would be transfer across to other sectors. Um, so I, I remember looking at a, a piece of kind of analysis that seemed to suggest that if you had worked in the agriculture sector, you were going to seamlessly translate transfer across to the IT sector, because that's where the jobs would open up. Um, so, you, you know, some of it just seems a little bit uh, divorced from reality. <laughs> the other big critique of impact assessments is that 
um, it's not obvious how they impact on actual negotiations. So, for example, so the EU's impact assessments, the main impact assessment is released at the end of neg negotiations. And there's actually quite a good reason for that, which is that it's hard to assess the impact of a thing before you actually know what you're dealing with. So that there is a reason why it comes late in the day. However, obviously also, that means that it's not really shaping what the trade agreement looks like. Um, so ideally, your impact assessments would be, you know, based on a slightly more real world analysis of, of what, what the kind of starting point is, um, and would also be designed in a way that they were able to kind of interact with the negotiations and influence what, nego what negotiations, you know, were covering and what, what the final deal looked like. Um, and I, I think the probably the final part of the picture is it's not obvious that there's a great deal of sort of um, com community engagement in that. So they sometimes they do know which sectors are going to be relatively more impacted, but they don't then take the next step of actually going out to talk to affected communities. Yeah, hopefully that answers some yeah. of that question. Yeah, thanks. That, that's really helpful. Thanks, Ruth. Does anyone else have a question at this stage? Uh, we realise it's an hour session and we're going through a lot, so it's <laughs> not ex we're not doing a pop quiz at the end of this, don't worry. Um, <laughs> oh, aren't we? <laughs> um, fab. Okay, so, I'll so carry it on. Seems like, it seems like, from what you've said, there's really, there's no actual thing in law, apart from in the Agriculture Bill, about what has to happen to a trade deal in the UK. So, so CRAG is the only thing, the Constitutional Reform and Government Act. So okay. you, lay, you lay the deal before Parliament for 21 sitting days. And if, um, if Parliament doesn't decide to or isn't able to get a debate and vote on the deal, <coughs> then the, the deal passes. That's it. OK, wow. Thank you very much. Yeah, mm -hmm. great. OK, so um, this is just an example of the way in which uh, trade agreements interact with, with sort of some of the important things that I'm sure many of us are, are thinking about. And we are looking at the interaction between trade and climate change. So I've, I've chosen to focus on that. And I've subtitled it, why are countries being sued for climate measures? So how trade um, deals interact with climate change is kind of in a number of ways, some of which are as follows. So um, climate and environmental measures are covered by by trade law, uh, for example, under the WTO and therefore in, in free trade agreements, rules must not be more restrictive than necessary to achieve a legitimate policy objective, um, and more trade restrictive than necessary to achieve a, a legitimate policy objective. So what this means is um, when you are developing your climate and environment uh, measures, you have to consider whether this is going to make it relatively more difficult to trade or invest uh, either in the UK or, or going out of the UK. And it's possible for a country to challenge that. And one of the things they're, they're also allowed to do is to say, well, you've decided on this particular measure, but actually we can see that country C over there has a different measure. Have you considered that one? So you can imagine that this is starting to create quite a kind of um, significant extra set of steps that need to be taken in order for your uh, climate and environment me measures to be trade compatible. Um, under the WTO and therefore free trade agreements, you must not discriminate against a partner country. Um, so this is um, national treatment. Um, and, and that kind of sounds OK, right? You don't want to discriminate um, arbitrarily against different countries, but there can be some consequences of this rule that that are sort of not allowed for within the trade system. So Canada had spotted that a particular fuel additive, whose name I've, I've managed to forget, but um, an, an additive that they had concerns about its impact, particularly on, on child health. And so they banned that additive um, in, in, I think it was petrol. Um, and they, they were taken to the WTO because as it happened, the only company using that was a US company and therefore it was able to be classified as discrimination. Um, as we've discussed, local content requirements are banned, and I think this has significant implications for the Just Transition agenda. 
Um, you also, under bilateral investment treaties, must not undermine a company's legitimate expectations. And um, one of my favorite examples from uh, investment law is an investor who felt that it was legitimate to expect 100 years of profit and indeed did win their case and were um, awarded a, a projected 100 years of profit, um, having had their, their um, contract cancelled. Um, so th those are the kinds of ways in which um, trade, trade and climate change can interact. And just to give you a sense of how that's fighting in the real world. So I've talked about the Canada feed-in tariff issue. That's the WTO case. Also under the WTO, uh, India has been challenged for its sol solar panel programs, again, for local content subsidy rules. Um, it was not allowed to use its commitments under the Paris Climate Agreement as a defence. US renewable energy, so this is India getting its own back on the US, they also challenged similar provisions. The UK has now been taken to the WTO just one year after becoming fully independent um, for also putting local co content requirements in its renewable energy scheme. Seemingly Bayes and DIT were not talking to each other sufficiently well at that point. The EU has been challenged under bilateral investment treaties the Netherlands has been challenged for phasing out coal fire power stations. Um, and you can imagine in that case, uh, an investor is requiring significantly more compensation than it would get anyway. So um, the Netherlands is offering compensation to, to companies that own these coal fire power stations. But um, a couple of the companies are trying to get much more compensation than they would, would get under this kind of normal, um, this normal program of of compensation. Canada's back on, ban on fracking under the St. Lawrence River has been challenged under investment provisions. US ban on, on an oil pipeline for, for an eye watering fix of like 16 billion is, is, is the challenge to the US ban on this oil pipeline. A UK company called Rockhopper is challenging Italy for its ban on oil and gas exploitation within 12 nautical miles of its coastline. So not even a complete ban, just a ban within a certain uh, distance of its coastline. And I should say for that case and most of the other ones, it's not that the com company has uh, spent a lot of money on infrastructure. In the case of Italy, there is no infrastructure there. Nothing has been put in place. It's not that they're being asked to dismantle oil rigs or anything. Um, it's that they paid for some scoping studies um, and therefore apparently have a legitimate expectation that they would have been making a profit for quite a long time. And, and kind of outside of trade and environment, just to give a couple of other examples, but, you know, again, if you're thinking of kind of what needs to be in place for climate measures to happen, uh, South Africa's Black Empowerment Act has also been challenged, um, again, successfully, and Egypt's minimum wage uh, was also challenged by our friends Veolia. Um, under the investment system. So you can see that all of these, these kind of, the, the trade uh, system really does bite on the kinds of things that countries might want to introduce under their, their climate policies, environmental policies, but also other sort of social justice um, policies. So then just really briefly, this is my last slide. In terms of things that we would like to see happening now um, from the UK, um, given its kind of unique position as, as having just got its competence back, um, and al also things like, you know, being having the chair of um, the, the COP, COP26, handing over to Egypt now for COP27, um, we would like them to publish a, a strategy. We would like them to also consider quite carefully which partners they are entering into negotiations with. Um, it, in this kind of next tranche of agreements are Gulf Corporation Council, uh, where I'm sure many of you will be aware there are some serious human rights concerns. Uh, over one recent weekend, they executed 81 people all, all, all at once, um, which kind of, and you know, anybody who's been looking at the Qatar World Cup will be aware that 1,200 migrant workers have died in the construction of um, stadiums and so on. So we, we are um, not convinced that these are the, the best countries to be um, entering into trade negotiations with. Um, we'd like the UK to formally align its trade policy with its other national and international commitments, particularly around climate change and also human rights and the sustainable development goals. Um, we want them to improve scrutiny and enshrine some of this in law. 
um, we'd like to see better public engagement. So, so um, you know, a broader public conversation about about how we want to shape um, our trade policy. Greater parliamentary involvement, including giving them adequate timeframes and a binding final vote. Um, a presumption of transparency during negotiations. Um, we think that's how you get the best trade deals is if everyone can see what's happening, um, you know, with, a, with the, a few exceptions where it's really sensitive um, and better impact assessments as, as we've discussed. Okay, so that's the end of my presentation. So hopefully we've got plenty of time for questions now. Um, my final slide has our website, our Twitter handle, and also a YouTube channel where we've, we've got quite a lot of webinars um, that we've been running over the past few weeks if you're interested in, in finding out more. Um, so I will unshare my screen, I think, now. Thanks very much, Ruth. Mm. We will, for anyone trying to get that um, YouTube channel, we can put that up. We have a mailing list and at Trade Justice Wales, um, and we will send out the links. This recording will go on to uh, Fair Trade Wales's YouTube channel and it will go out. Um, the link has just been added of where Trade Justice Wales is for you to keep up to date with things. And like I said, we have an email that goes out. So Diolch and Vaur, thank you very much for that.